Hi! Merry Christmas! Welcome to my channel. I am Peachy Bai and this is a mini applause for you. Why do you get a mini applause? Because you deserve it and because you're amazing and you deserve it on this wonderful Christmas day and this awesome festive season, um, if you celebrate or not. But either way, I just hope that you're having a satisfactory day. <laughs> <laughs> so be a minimum of like a good wish for someone have a satisfactory day um, and because you are amazing and because you deserve it and I believe that you're gonna make it through tomorrow since you've made it through all the rest of the days of the years that have passed I would love it if you could just hit that subscribe button and pop the notification bell so you can be here when I post another video before we get into our exegesis of Luke 1 and 2 and comparison between Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, I just want to say thank you to Tendal House for allowing me to use the Bible so that I can read the Bible and read scriptures because the NLT is the boss version in my opinion. Fight me, I don't care, I love it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so unless otherwise indicated, all the following scripture quotations are taken from the Holy Bible New Living Translation with copyright by Tyndale House Foundation, used by permission of Tyndale House Publishers, all rights reserved. So yeah, just have to pop that little disclaimer in there. And let's go! Okay, okay. so Luke, Luke 1, in comparison from Matthew 1 to Luke 1, right? Luke starts off with telling us not the story of Jesus, but Luke starts with establishing his credibility. He also tells us of his motives, why is he writing this book? And he also um, tells us that he wants a man that he called the most honorable Philo what Theophilus, sorry, <laughs> Theophilus. He wants uh, Theophilus to be certain of the truth. So essentially he's saying, I went to research and this is a book of facts now, right? Which is quite interesting because Matthew didn't actually do that little bit of setup, and also what um, what Luke does says the writer of the book doesn't necessarily have to be a name a man named Luke. I don't think they know who wrote the Gospels actually. That's quite interesting. So we'll we'll check that out in a couple. I don't know. I guess in another video. Yeah. So um, yeah. So Luke starts really with a prequel. He starts with with the annunciator of Christ, the prophet John the Baptist and his origins and the story of his birth, which I thought was, was really quite interesting because um, in the other Gospels, from what I can recall, there's not much mentioned about John and his origins. It's just that this is a crazy guy that lived in the wilderness, but everybody knew he was a prophet from God kind of thing. So I really thought that, uh, that, that Luke diving into John's origins was quite interesting. Yeah, and uh, I say that it's fitting because John is older than Jesus, right? And it also reveals that John is Jesus' cousin through uh, Mary and Elizabeth being cousins. And uh, since we know that John is the prophet meant to prepare the way for the Messiah, it sets up a nice chronology, right? Okay, verse 5 confirms Herod being king. I checked uh, Mark was the first book of the gospel that was written, right? And that was followed by the book of Matthew which was written 15 years after that one. And then that was followed by the Gospel of Luke, also written 15 years later, like 15 years after Matthew. And just in case you're wondering, I checked the, about the numerology, the Hebrew numerology of the number 15, is that it's um, the, the number 15 implies salvation, ascending or ascension, and healing and redemption. So that I thought was quite interesting. It, it also represents elevation from physical to spiritual which is like quite relevant for the story of jesus i would think so despite the fact that this there's not necessarily something that can control who writes what book 15 years later or anything it's just that those dates might be significant for some reason that is spiritual in nature and i thought that that was quite interesting about the the times when those books were written anyway yeah so I think it's part of God's plan um, because from what we've established in the book of Matthew, God is a planner. So let's talk about Zechariah and Elizabeth who are um, John's parents and why their lineage is relevant, right? In accordance with some research that I've done, <laughs> very light research, Herod the king at the time was appointing priests in the temple for 
political benefit, right? Or politically motivated appointments of priests in the temple. So from Exodus 28, we see that Aaron and his line are consecrated to do priestly tasks for the tabernacle, right? But this, the scriptures actually say that they are set apart from the rest of the people of Israel. But, um, and at the end of Exodus 28, um, verse 40, it says this is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants. So what Herod is doing by putting just anyone in the temple is he's kind of desecrating the temple. It's, it's kind of like um, crapping all over God's intended purpose for the priests and for the, the order in order to, um, I don't know, I guess manipulate in a way um, that he felt was comfortable. So it was very important that both Elizabeth and Zechariah are from the, the line of Aaron because it shows that they had the right to serve in the Lord's temple. They had the right to be there, right? And uh, this is also affirmed by verse 6, which says that God said there were, um, the angel of Elib said, no, <laughs> not God or the angel. Yeah, but anyway, so the scriptures say, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. The scriptures say that they were righteous in God's eyes. I thought that was quite wonderful. So verse 7 notes that Elizabeth was unable to conceive. This was interesting for me because despite the fact that they were righteous in God's eyes, they still weren't able to conceive. So that tells you that maybe infertility is not due to sin like maybe people are intending or saying. Infertility might be part of God's plan for your life, and that's it's a difficult thing to understand. And, and I'm not I'm not painting everything with a brush, like uh, painting all the same color. But I'm just saying that in this case with Elizabeth, infertility was part of God's plan. That's interesting. Okay, moving on. Yeah. So, um, oh, another thing that I noticed that was interesting was despite the fact that Elizabeth was barren, Zechariah didn't take another wife even though he might have had the right to do so um I'm, I'm thinking that it's possible that he chose not to because he didn't want to um or just because he uh, I, I mean at the time it could have been that society was like oh you can have a hundred different wives if this one isn't giving you children you know like to expand your um expand your family and stuff like that but it might not actually have been that common or a common practice at the time. Maybe it was just something done for political motives, like with kings or governors having more than one wife or something like that. So this was interesting because I'd always assumed that um, the biblical marriages in the Bible were like lots and lots of people. But here Zechariah, who has a legitimate reason from back in the day to take another wife, doesn't. I guess maybe because he loves his wife or maybe because he loves the Lord. I don't know. But... I thought that was good. So yeah, anyway, Elizabeth and Zechariah are basically like Sarah and Abram's story done right in a sense because Sarah didn't believe that God would give her a child. But there's also a parallel because in, in this story, Zechariah didn't believe in a sense that God would give him a child. So God shut, uh, the angel shut him up basically for a while. Yeah. So yeah, so um, with Sarah and Abram, we were told that they are both very old. And that's the same thing that's happening with uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Sarah was barren. Elizabeth was barren as well. Um, yeah. Oh, so um, when Zechariah went to the temple, he was chosen at random to enter the sanctuary and burn incense. And while he was there, an angel appeared to him. I thought that it was significant that he was chosen at random. Because um, this means that he couldn't have planned it. Or he couldn't have, no one could have known that he would have gone in there. So it's not something that's likely to be, oh, Zechariah fabricated the story. It's something that most likely would have happened. You remember that Luke is checking for this fact. He went out to find out what happened. Because the book says, the intro of the book says that he investigated. Okay? So in verse 11, we see that God communicated through an angel. And since it's implied that Zechariah was awake at the time, um, and these events took place before those of Mary and Joseph's dreams or visions and stuff like that, right? We can tell that God's method of communicating at the time was not exclusive to dreams, which was what I looked at in Matthew 1 2, right? So, um, yeah, noticeably, the angel appeared on the right side of the incense altar. Um, there are several theories about the angel like displaying his rank or his divinity by standing on the right hand side of the altar 
But personally, I think that he could have done this sort of in respect to God or to reaffirm God's honor. And and maybe if he stepped on the left, God might have been like, no, that's the wrong thing to do. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. So I thought that was a little bit relevant, right? And then we have the angel telling Zechariah and his and his wife that he will conceive. So uh, verse 15 is especially interesting for two reasons. Right? Number one, John is instructed to never touch wine or drink alcoholic drinks. And this is before his birth, right? Now this alludes to the Nazarite vow, which was a vow from the book of Numbers 6, um, in which an individual could choose, right? Uh, like they could choose to do it. It was to abstain from certain things and consecrate yourself to the Lord, right? So the, though the Nazarite vow goes that much further than um, than just no drinking kind of thing, um, like it extends even as far as to don't eat grapes. You're not allowed to eat the skin or anything from the vine of a grape plant. I'm not sure why that is. Yeah, so... Um, he wasn't, he wasn't given a choice. The Nazarite vow was something you could do and take for yourself. But in this case, John wasn't given that choice, which I thought was quite interesting, right? So you can find the Nazarite vow in number 6 if you're interested. But part 2 of verse, 16, um, verse 15 sorry, says that John uh, would be filled with the Holy Spirit from even before his birth. And this is relevant because in terms, if you have the same assumption as me or as I did, growing up when thinking about the Bible and all of these things. You remember that Jesus um, Jesus said much later on in the Gospels, after he, after he ascended to heaven, he said, I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. So my assumption was that the Holy Spirit only came down to earth after Jesus left. And what I was thinking was, as far as I know, other people are teaching this in church as well. But here we're seeing in the book of Luke, the Holy Spirit was present in a baby before the baby was born. The Holy Spirit was in the baby's parents. The Holy Spirit was in between Mary and Elizabeth when they got together. I was like, so the Holy Spirit has been just like chilling here all the time and no one's been paying attention to this. So I thought that was quite amazing. Yeah. So yeah, from verse 17, um, <sighs> number 17, being compared to Elijah was actually a huge honor. So John was being compared to Elijah and it kind of still is because he was one of the super, like superhero prophets at the time. And uh, yeah, so I thought that was, that was quite amazing that, that John was compared to Elijah because that actually tells you of John's importance or John's, uh, I don't know, I guess power, so to speak. Yeah. So in verse 17, the part saying that he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children indicated to me that the fathers were perhaps neglectful or distant or not understanding with their kids. And I thought that that was wonderful that God threw that in there, turning the hearts of the fathers to their children, not turning the hearts of the children to their fathers. Yeah. And uh, verse 17 also says he will cause those who are rebellious to accept godly wisdom and uh, this is an incredible mandate that's been given to John from before birth. He's, he's basically set aside, right, to be like an extreme prophet, a prophet of like extreme stature and of extreme wisdom and all of these things. And I was like, wow, that's that's a lot of pressure for a little kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Born to like really elderly parents. That's a lot of pressure for a kid to handle. Yikes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but um, this mandate also indicates that God knows the end from the beginning because um, we know that from later stories of the life of John, that John was a phenomenal prophet, that he did set inside a bot for God, that he, he lived in the wilderness. And I believe that that's one of the reasons he lived in the wilderness as well. Anyway, so verse 18 for me was hilarious, right? So remember in verse 13, the angel says, God has heard you pray, right? Meaning that despite his old age, Zechariah was hoping, trusting, and praying, believing God for a child. He was believing for that despite his old age. And then the first thing that he says is, uh, how can you be sure to an angel that appeared in from the middle of nowhere? <laughs> this was like, Zechariah, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> Do you believe or not, right? So he didn't actually say thank you, Lord, or rejoice. He, he didn't like receive the pro prophecy. He just like straight up doubted that this was going to happen. He's like, 
I'm I'm like the dude standing in front of you is an angel, the worst person to say I don't know, you know, <laughs> like that too would probably have been the angel delivering the news, right? Um, I like to think like the angel was like a little bit gobsmacked, they're like taken aback and like dude, I just came from heaven. God told me to come and tell you this and this is all you can say. <laughs> so yeah. So as a result, the angel kind of disabled him um, uh, from speaking because of his disbelief, right? And then lets him know that his uh, his speech will return once the child is born, right? And then he ends verse 20 by basically reinforcing that Zechariah should have believed because now he's kind of forced to trust God because his speech is now taken away, right? That's that's crazy. So I I think that this is uh, something to be said for believing in your heart, being just as important as confessing with your mouth. I think that the two are going hand in hand. Yeah, so from verse 21 to 23, we see it reaffirmed that Zechariah was alone in the temple, right? And um, once his week of service in the temple was done, he went home to his wife and then impregnated her. They did the deed. And in verse 24, uh, scripture said that Elizabeth went into seclusion for five month, months. So I wondered if this was because of like the customs or like why did why did she go into seclusion? So when I looked it up, ResearchGate says that um, that her seclusion seclusion was an act of faith because she was like likely past the child. She was probably past child bleeding age as well, aside from being barren, right? And um, she wouldn't have been able to tell that she was pregnant because she wouldn't have had a period at that age. Um, so going into into like seclusion would have been Elizabeth accepting the word of the Lord, saying that she would be pregnant, right? But while that's a really nice lady, I felt that maybe it's because of the superstition in society that she went into seclusion as well. They might have maybe like labeled her old, or senile, or involved her with witchcraft, any other kind of crap. Because she's going around at her age telling people, yeah, I'm pregnant. Or people are looking at her, seeing her being pregnant might have been something alarming, you know. And, um, yeah. And I was I was like, yeah. It, it doesn't make sense also because who could have told Elizabeth what the angel said since her husband was mute at the time. At least her husband wrote it down and explained it to her what the angel said, you know. But um, yeah, we don't, I don't think we have enough information here to come to any solid conclusions. Yeah. Anywho, yeah. Um, another theory is that it could have been uh, Zechariah who sent her away, like just in case, you know, because that kind of would tie in with his unbelief. Like, you know, maybe you should go just in case, but in case it doesn't happen, then you can come back again after five months, kind of thing. <laughs> you know. It might have still been part of his act of like disbelief, yeah. Anyway, so verse 26, the same angel that spoke to Zechariah went to Mary also. And uh, verse 27 repeats that Joseph is the ancestor of King David, not Mary, right? And Mary had not married him yet at the at the time of the angel's visit. Remember that the Bible says that when they were engaged, right? So, yeah. And verse 28 and 29 doesn't really make sense to me, right? It reads, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you, right? Then 29 says that Mary was confused and disturbed. So, uh, and and trying to think of what the angel could mean, right? So the footnote, however, explains that the other versions read, blessed are you among women. And that makes a lot more sense for her to be like, uh, why am I blessed amongst all of these other women? What's the difference you know, why Why am I special kind of thing. That makes a lot more sense when put that way. So I think this translation didn't really hit the mark there with that explanation. Right? And so from verse 30 to 33, the angel basically reassures her and tells her she's found favor with God. And um, yeah, he says she's going to have a baby that's going to be the Messiah. Right? But verse 31, however, mentions she will conceive, not her and Joseph. Right? Pay attention to that. Although it just may have been the way that the angel spoke, here we are told the angel tells Mary to name the child Jesus. But in Matthew, we are told that the angel tells Joseph to name the child Jesus. Right? And uh, this might be a little bit confusing because you might be saying to yourself, but how is the Bible conflict itself? Here's the thing. Both could have happened. The angel could have appeared to Mary at the time and said, you know the child Jesus, then appeared to Joseph also in a dream later on, right? Once they discovered that Mary was pregnant and say, you're going to name the child Jesus because 
this is he's gonna be his name so you know the, the Bible is still accurate right um, so verse 32 says that God will give him the throne of his ancestor David yet Mary is still not the one from the line of David it's Joseph right so I still feel that this points to that adoption right and uh, yeah <clears throat> So yeah, um, yeah. So Mary is not like in disbelief when she asks how she will conceive this child. She's basically asking anatomically, like you know what I mean, like with regard to anatomy. Yo, I never slept with anyone at all. So, yikes, <laughs> kind of thing. Bible sex said for the win here, <laughs> because she's being she's being explicit and asking this question. She's not just like, mm, okay, fair enough. She's like, there's something missing. I'm not understanding what's happening. And then the angel in verse uh, 30, uh, 35, right, um, says that the Holy Spirit will come upon her, making the conceived baby holy and not the son of man here, but says the son of God, right? So that's what the angel says to her. So I, I feel that this really still points to Jesus being adopted by Joseph and the fact that God doesn't care about the fact that Joseph is not his biological father. So God sees you. If you are someone's adopted child, it doesn't matter to God. He sees you as that person's child because you are now that person's child. I think that's amazing. Anyway, so yeah, so this passage is really like a test of your faith. Can you accept that Jesus was born to a virgin? Because if you cannot accept that, this is the basis of Christianity. No judgment, just something to think about for like personal reflection. All right, tighty. So yeah, um... Yeah, so if Jesus was born of man and woman, that completely takes away his divinity. Because we all, everyone else here is born from a man and a woman. And if Jesus is not, then, then that means that he is divine. But if, <laughs> he's divine. But if we, if we believe that Jesus was born from Joseph's seed in any way, shape or form, we're completely scratching out Jesus' divinity there. So this is quite interesting. Anyway, the angel completes his reveal by telling Mary that her cousin, the barren one, is pregnant and uh, is essentially reminding her that God is a God of miracles, right? And so Mary's response in comparison with Zechariah's indicates that she believes and then she volunteers herself for the Lord's use, right? And in verse 39, we see that Mary's decided to visit Elizabeth. She actually like hired it there, right? Um, and uh, maybe she wanted someone to talk to. I thought that that would be understanding um, because uh, verse 24 actually mentioned that Elizabeth went into seclusion but in verse 40 we see that Mary went to Zechariah's house and there was Elizabeth so I'm thinking that maybe she just withdrew from society right so verse 41 reaffirms what the angel said about John having the Holy Spirit because the child leapt in Elizabeth's womb upon hearing uh, Mary's greeting and Elizabeth as an end result was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So despite this being like a really amazing moment for Elizabeth, it was also this confirmation for Mary, right? It was the first, um, it was the first sign of confirmation for Mary because um, like seeing Elizabeth pregnant would have been the first sign of confirmation, right? And then like the, the, the next sign of confirmation would come from Elizabeth repeating the angel's words, saying, Blessed are you above all women, right? And then in verse 43, what is especially wonderful is Elizabeth acknowledges Jesus as a Lord, right? And it's it's huge because she and her husband were Jews at the time, right? And Jesus hadn't even been born yet. And um, she had such great faith, right? That she accepted before even knowing if she would see, she would love to see Jesus Christ born that he would be the savior. That's quite amazing. Yeah, I also like that under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Mary is acknowledged and honored as being the mother of Jesus and not just as like the cousin of Elizabeth, right? So yeah, so Elizabeth then explains why Mary is best. Remember that in verse 29, Mary was trying to figure out why the angel was calling her blessed among women. So Elizabeth is saying, no, you're blessed because you believed what the Lord said quite good i think that this could be a key to blessing that if you want to be blessed you have to believe what the lord says amazing anyway so yeah so we have mary's magnificent um from verse 46 uh, to 53 i believe 
And so she, she kind of humble brags in the beginning. She calls herself the Lord's lowly servant and then says, from now on, all generations are going to call me blessed kind of thing. She's acknowledging publicly what the angel said and the Elizabeth reaffirmed, right? And then from verse 52 and 53, we see comparisons of like humility, right? God brings down royalty, but exalts the humble. Sends the rich away empty-handed, but fills the hungry with good things. Those kind of things. I thought this was this was really quite a beautiful passage, right? And then uh, she makes some observations about God as well. And um, remember that Mary's Magnificat was actually a response to what Elizabeth said to her, right? So it wasn't like she went off on a tangent and then like just started reciting a poem. <laughs> she the vibe is that the Holy Spirit was there. Be present between Mary and Elizabeth and then they like started to prophesy they were like worshipping and that was like amazing they were under the influence of the Holy Spirit and worshipping another another thing that's alluding to the fact that the Holy Spirit was present before Jesus said I will send the comforter right um, so verse 56 indicates that Mary left three months later right bearing in mind that Elizabeth was pregnant six months at the time it's unclear if Mary stayed for the birth to me and perhaps she didn't because it didn't, doesn't look like she made uh, this trip to visit Elizabeth with Joseph right and uh, maybe she wanted not to be seen in public pregnant while unmarried right so then next is the birth of John and uh, I like that everybody rejoiced together at the beginning. Yeah, and it, uh, yeah, verse 59 shows how kids might have been named at the time at his circumcision ceremony. So for eight days, right, the child wasn't named until like the circumcision and then like chop, yes, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so the people there, right? I thought it was Elizabeth's family that was around, but. Notice uh, what the words say, that when Elizabeth is uh, present there and the, the people are saying, let's name the child of his father. And she says, nope, his name is John. And so the, the crowd gathered there, say to Elizabeth, there's no one in your family. That leads me to think that none of the people in that crowd were from her family. Right? Remember that Elizabeth and, 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 and Zechariah were quite old. So maybe the family had passed away or maybe the family had stayed somewhere away from the family. But that means that nobody that was speaking at that point was from their families, right? And then Zechariah, who is, is not speaking, right? Um, he, they, they ask him about the child's name. And then he writes on the tablet that... The child's name is John. Now, don't forget that Zechariah wasn't speaking all this time. Remember, the angel said to him that after the birth of the child, his voice would return, right? But his voice hadn't returned when the child was born. So I'm thinking that this period of eight days after the child was born, probably like quite stressful because he, he might have been like, oh, shoot, is my voice ever going to come back again? But we'd still like, have to rein that fear in and go, you know what? No, God said it well because the last time I said something, it got me into trouble. So let me just not think that way. So yeah. And uh, yeah, eight days after the child was born at the ceremony with no indication of whether or not his voice would return now. Like he's had eight days to accept my voice is still not back and my son is born. And after he says... He, he writes on this little tablet thing that they give him, um, like stone tablet. The child's name is John. There is voice returns, which is amazing. And and for me, that, that proves that when Zechariah affirmed that this is the work of the Lord, this is what God intended, then his voice was returned to him. I thought that was quite amazing, right? And so this chapter ends with Zechariah making a prophecy. And notice it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit at the time. Another one, another scripture indicating the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yes, uh, Jesus says that he was sending the comforter in John 14 verse 16, right? So Zechariah's prophecy is actually like a personal proclamation of his beliefs, right? He thanks God for redemption, then agrees that Jesus is the Savior from the line of David. He mentions God fulfilling the prophecies, says the Israelites or Jews will not be saved from their enemies and those who hate them. Um, well, that leads me to think that they were under some kind of uh, anti-Semitism or oppression that might have been common in the land, right? Or, or back in the day as well, right? And then he remembers God's mercy, talks about God fulfilling the covenant to Abraham, 
I'm betting that was especially significant to him because of the parallels between his story and Abraham's. But also we know that Abraham is very significant to the Jewish culture, right? And then he says that since the, the, the Jews are being rescued, they can serve God without fear, right? And that leads me to think that there were factions among the Jews, right? Of like maybe orthodox and unorthodox belief systems that that meant uh, and maybe people were moving more towards the unorthodox belief system which meant that it might have been more difficult for them to express they wanted to serve God in a certain way right yeah and um, yeah so oh yes remember that at the beginning of the chapter Zechariah and Elizabeth being righteous in God's eyes would have made sense with this orthodox and unorthodox kind of belief system being important and, and causing fear for them because their belief systems might have been incredibly orthodox and for them to be considered righteous by God, I would think so. You know? Yeah, so he ends the prophecy with the little prophecy for his son and you can just hear his, his love for his son in his first words and he says, and you, my little son, oh, it just gives me lovely little tingles. I love it when you see a dad actively taking on that role of a dad and just, you know, loving and protecting his son. Yeah, so it also it's also great that he acknowledges what John's role will be. Right, then in uh, verse 77, he mentions salvation through forgiveness of sin. This is the first time I have seen this mentioned in the New Testament. I have not seen it from the early parts of any of the other books, but uh, remember the books weren't written exactly at the same time. They were just written about events taking place at the same time. So I thought this was interesting. Yeah, and um, yeah, and, and also... Uh, John actually did fulfill his ministry, right? He was preaching salvation through repentance. We know this from the Bible. And then in verse uh, 79, Zechariah says that Jesus would guide us to the path of peace. And this was especially relevant because the Jews at the time believed that the Messiah would come and overthrow the government and like kill off all the enemies and sort of like return the, the punishment that they were going through due to the exile and to the disbandment of the culture and all those kind of things, um, you know, because th that's all part of the Bible, the, the history of the Israelites. And and it's, it's kind of like a violent takeover in comparison with Jesus's actual, you know what I mean, Jesus' actual vibe, which was so peaceful and so like non-confrontational, except for that one time in the temple when he threw the tables over. Yeah. And uh, it makes up one of the fundamental reasons why not all Jews believe that Jesus was the Messiah and did not like convert to the new way of believing in God, right? So, so that really makes a lot of sense there because here Jesus is coming as the King of Peace. He's coming with peace, and here these people are like, uh, these guys have been oppressing us. We don't want to forgive them. We want to kill them. <laughs> we want to get rid of them. They've been oppressing us. And they're probably going to continue oppressing us, despite the fact that we say, oh, we forgive you. We want to get rid of them. <laughs> so, I mean, it makes sense, though. But anyway, so verse 80 wraps up nicely the story arc of John. And interestingly, it mentions that he lived in the wilderness. I've, I've already spoken about this. Um, I think that he did it to avoid temptation. And if that was his reason for living in the wilderness, kudos. That's a very smart move. Anyway, so chapter 2. In this chapter, we start with a census and it shows us that Joseph was aware of his royal lineage because he knew that he had to go back to the town of Bethlehem, Judea to go and register for the census in the place where David was born, David's ancestral dwelling place. Right? And verse 4 indicates that Joseph was living in Nazareth, Galilee at the time. So um, this was before Jesus was born that Joseph and possibly Mary also were living in that same town of Galilee. So I thought that was cool. Verse 5 tells us that Mary was pregnant and they were still engaged, not married at, at, at the time of Jesus' birth, which cuts out the theory that I had in the previous video of Matthew, which spoke about how um, it's possible that Jesus and Mary got married and therefore Jesus being a child of the union, in essence, would have made him from the line of David, but they were unmarried. It's very significant, I found. Yeah, so Mary, verse 7 actually says Mary gives birth um, to Jesus while Mary and Joseph were still engaged, which kind of makes Jesus a bastard. <laughs> I know that's a, <laughs> that's a crappy thing to say, but 
technically it's true because the term of bastard really means a child born out of wedlock and that's what jesus is and for me this is especially significant because it shows god doesn't care about titles he doesn't care about those titles he cares about your role and he cares about who you are i thought this is wonderful so yeah so in the two accounts of Jesus' birth, the scene where the innkeeper is not giving them a room doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Although it's like technically true because there wasn't room for him except for in a manger, right? It makes me think of how many things in Christianity that we believe in that's not true but actually just came from a movie. Yikes. <laughs> it's, yeah, we need to brush up on our biblical facts here. Anyway, so yeah, so the next part talks about the shepherds and angels and... I noticed that there was no talk of the wise men in this book so I thought that was interesting and um, maybe Luke just didn't know to ask or didn't know to think of um, you know to, to check on that thing um, but yeah so there was no mention of the wise men there and uh, remember that the, that the author of Luke said that he set out to determine the facts and uh, that, I think that will be a pretty important fact. But it depends on whether or not the two Gospels were circulating at the same time, which is unlikely. So that might have been just something that someone forgot to mention. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's nothing new or particularly interesting about the story of angels, um, like celebrating. Because like, okay, yeah, we get it. The angels are celebrating. But verse 18 and 19 are particularly interesting to me because it talks about the shepherds telling everyone what they saw, but says that Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And it makes me feel almost like she wanted to keep a little baby, a beautiful boy to herself. And um, yeah, though she's still aware that he was a savior, he's got a purpose, right? It still makes me feel like she's like, oh, he's my baby. You know, and I was like, I'm so sweet. Anyway, so verse 21, Jesus is presented at the temple eight days later. So remember, he was only named at this point. Um, he was also circumcised, uh, which was a tradition for the Israelites. So verse 22 expands on this uh, tradition by mentioning that Joseph and Mary, because Jesus was a firstborn son to a, a woman, um, they would have to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice to purify the child and consecrate the child to the Lord. Then we've got the prophecy of Simeon and uh, this mention of the Holy Spirit being on Simeon as well. And that the Spirit had revealed that he would see this, the Messiah and the Spirit had led him to the temple. So we're seeing the Holy Spirit is quite active here in the beginning of the New Testament already. Um, I, I have not read the later books of the Old Testament. I'm still in the book of Psalms and uh, I haven't really seen much mention of the Holy Spirit before then so it will be interesting as i go through the bible uh, i like to read the bible in the evenings to my son and it's going to be interesting to go along and see where we stop noticing the spirit being mentioned and stuff more frequently throughout the bible leading up to the beginning of the new testament and, uh, and whether or not it's there anyway, well mentioned at least yeah so yeah oh yes Simeon is not a priest he was just described in the bible as a righteous man right but yeah, so it, it, this all shows me that Simeon had quite an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit led him to the uh, to the temple at, the, at that day. And I like Simeon's prophecy because it repeats what Mary, Elizabeth, and Zechariah previously said, affirming the word of the Lord and uh, through the angels and the previous prophecies. It also says in verse 29 that, that Simeon can now die in peace, he says. And while it seems kind of morbid, it's actually kind of sweet. He's, he's saying... Oh, I was worried about my people. I was worried about my salvation. I was worried about all of these things. But now I can relax because I know the Savior is here. I know He's come and I don't have to stress anymore. I don't have to, like, intercede myself to death because I'm worried about all everybody else and our salvation. Anyway, so yeah, so what especially stands out for me is that when someone talks to Mary, he sort of lays it out for her, right? Your son's going to do great things. And I know you love him very much, but he's got a purpose and you are going to get hurt very, very much because of your love for him. So just be aware. Right, then Anna comes in, right, in verse 36 and 37 kind of gives her backstory or gives her credibility. For example, um, it says, she never left the temple, but stayed there day and night worshipping God and fasting and praying. So that's saying that she was a particularly religious woman, right? And then we actually don't get a worded prophecy from Anna, 
right? Although the text says that she began praising God, right? So since uh, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 indicates that prophecy is for edification, exhortation and comfort, in other words, to strengthen, to um, encourage and to comfort, I think it's safe to say that her prophecy will likely fell along these lines. So the writer may not have felt it's necessary to include it because other people were there or maybe it wasn't available, maybe no one could remember exactly what she said and um, it wasn't factual enough for the writer to include it. So that was interesting. So our reading ends with verse 39 to 40, giving us a little bit of a conclusion and updating us on the story briefly before moving on to um, what the writer found relevant. I thought that was good. So a side note is I took a look at some of the names um, of the people in the Bible, right? And Elizabeth might come from the Hebrew name Elisheba, which means oath of God. Joseph comes from the Hebrew name Yosef, and that means he will add. Right? Anna comes from the name Hana, or there's another one, I think you say Kana or Chana or something like that, which means grace. And Mary comes from the name of Miriam, which means beloved. Quite interesting. So, what have we learned so far? We've learned that Jesus' birth was a miracle virgin birth, right? Number two, we've also learned that Jesus was essentially a bastard. <laughs> Yeah, and number number three, Jesus' birth is fundamental to our Christian belief system. Number four, God communicated through angel vis and angel visitations, not just dreams. Um, number five, Jesus being adopted makes him from the line of line of David. If we believe Ephesians one verse five to eleven, that makes us direct heirs of God and means that we are entitled to inheritance from God. Because um, we are the children of God and we're entitled to all the gifts from God because we are his direct children, right? And uh, yeah, so uh, number six, Jesus' lineage is an act of faith in and of itself, right? And uh, number seven, women in the Bible are awesome. Women of mention in the story of Jesus, women of mention across the Bible are so awesome and so relevant and we need to talk about them a lot more and about their role in the Bible and, and their understanding, their faith and all these amazing characteristics they have, right? And we've also learned that belief is the key to blessing. Now, this video has gone on so much longer <laughs> than I intended. So, so much longer. But before we go, we're just going to head to our scripture of the day. And that comes from 1 John 2 verse 14 which says, I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. Amen. So I hope that you have a phenomenal Christmas. Please don't forget to join us for our Lonely Arts, Christmas, uh, for Lonely Arts for Christmas stream, which is going to be happening at 8.30 p.m. UTC plus 2. Thank you so much for joining me. There will be a giveaway. Please have a phenomenal Christmas. Bye.